Something about the Mandalorian feels different. Something about the works of Jon Favreau have changed. Many are calling this the phony baloney felony era. Was that fair? What's going on? What's happened with the tonal shift? Get ready, folks. We're going to explain it all in just a moment. Explaining entertainment, keeping you ahead of the culture curve. It's what we do each and every day here on the WDW Pro channel. And particularly, I am excited about this one because I get the chance to really explain some stuff to you that you may not understand otherwise. I'm going to tell you why I think the uh, Lucasfilm works, the Book of Boba Fett, and The Mandalorian have shifted in terms of what we perceive to be quality, but maybe something entirely different. I think you're going to enjoy this. And then I think you're going to understand what's going on behind the scenes with the entertainment a little bit better. That's the goal each and every day here. Folks, if you like content like this, consider clicking the like button, share, subscribe, and you can stick it to the algorithms. When you click it, we're talking about that notification bell. Don't forget that if you're watching this video on its premiere date, the pro show is this afternoon, 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern time. You can join in live and check out me and the panel all discussing all the stuff that's going on in entertainment as of late. All right, but let's talk about what's going on with The Mandalorian. And to do this, we're going to go through IMDb, making this possible. And basically, I want to break down all of the episodes of this show. There's not that many. There's only eight episodes per season. And then we're going to see if we can find where the change happened and why that change happened. Now, just taking a look at the very beginning, we've got the uh, first chapter simply called The Mandalorian. Most of us remember this one. And uh, the storyline is simple. A Mandalorian bounty hunter tracks a target for a well-paying, mysterious client. Of course, this was the one where he first discovered little baby Grogu. At the time, we didn't know his name. He was just a child. And so that was Baby Yoda. He received an 8.6 score. But we're going to notice that by the time we get later into this series, things are going to change. But let's stick with it and see how the first season really was so amazing that it was uh, driving Disney Plus subscribers in ways that Disney had not anticipated and also earned John Favreau a sweetheart deal. The second episode was no slouch either, also earning an 8.5. And uh, in this one, the storyline says, after fighting off some bounty hunters who were tracking the child, the Mandalorian returns to his ship to find it scavenged by Jawas. Remember this one? Everybody, where he has to go and get the egg, but it's uh, guarded by the big beast, and people enjoyed it. 8.5. Chapter 3, The Sin. Uh, this one was with the armorer, who uh, we, I guess... Who knows about being a spy? That was weird, huh? Uh, in this latest season, but the storyline here, Mando returns the bounty and uses the reward to forge new armor Armor at the co at the uh, covert underground lair. The other Mandalorian bounty hunters express their disdain with consorting with the enemy. And uh, this one was very well received in 8.9. Now notice that all three of the first episodes I would not describe as being juvenile or childish or immature. These were These were all episodes that uh, drove subscribers, got people re-excited after the sequel trilogy, and they were all aimed, it seems like, uh, more adult Star Wars fans. That's not to say that kids didn't enjoy them. That's why Baby Yoda was there. But at the same time, they, they were uh, uh, quite... Uh, the, well, let's put it this way. In the very first episode, if you go to the first few minutes, you can tell that it's, it's spaghetti western, but it's, it's like Clint Eastwood uh, spaghetti western, right? The Mandalorian is truly a bounty hunter, and that, that maintained true for those first three episodes. Here we have our first drop. This is uh, Chapter 4, Sanctuary, and uh, the story on this one is the Mandalorian teams up with an ex-soldier to protect a farming village from raiders. What do we notice here? The first drop comes from a side quest episode. This was really the first side quest episode. Now, you could claim the Jawas, but he was kind of stuck in that, that story. Uh, but in Chapter 4, it's straight up a side quest, and so it gets a 7.7. .7. It seems like there may be a pattern that we see as we go along. Chapter 5 of the first season, again, a 7.5, another drop after those stellar first three episodes. This is the Gunslinger, and this one simply says, on a familiar desert planet, the Mandalorian helps a rookie bounty hunter who is in over his head. Once again, sort of a side quest. But let's also say that none of these were immature. None of these were childish. We, we hop back up, though, again for Chapter 6, an 8.3 rating overall, 26,000 different ratings, so you know that uh, that's a, quite the sample size. And uh, Chapter 6, The Prisoner, The Mandalorian is part of a crew of mercenaries springing a, con a convict from a prison ship. I think a lot of people really enjoyed this one, 
and uh, introduced some, uh, some new characters that I think a lot of people enjoyed. All right, so, but that one was definitely not uh, a childish kind of thing. Then we got to chapter seven, The Reckoning. This was a 9.0. This is probably one of those episodes that vault, uh, vaulted this series into being, well, what it became by season two. It says, an old contact extends an invitation with Mandalorian to make peace with his enemies. I think we know this guy, right? We've seen him before. He shows up uh, in this latest season. Uh, I don't think that's a spoiler at this point. Of course, we also had lots of Carl Weathers and Gina Carano in that one. And again, not at all an immature or childish episode. Chapter eight, same thing. Redemption, the Mandalorian and his allies come to know their true enemy who already knows much about them. This one uh, directed by Taika Waititi, but missing much of what usually defines a Taika Waititi directed piece of entertainment. Uh, and it really, it was dire. The, you thought some of these characters were truly going to die. That was not out of the question because it had not been presented in a way that uh, would make you feel otherwise, right? The stakes were extreme in this one and uh, all hope seemed lost. So for the first season, really, there were two side quest episodes, arguably three, and really no juvenile or childish episodes. That's a key thing, everybody. Keep paying attention. We're going to start seeing the shift now in this second season. Make sure to catch The Pro Show Thursdays, 5 to 7 Eastern Time. Entertainment Explained, The Culture Curve Conquered, live with Pro and all his friends. Chapter 9, The Marshal, 8.8 .8 rating again. Uh, this one, not at all uh, childlike or silly. And uh, The Mandalorian is drawn to the Outer Rim in search of others of his kind. Uh, it was a very strong opening to the second season. and really solidified that people believed that uh, John Favreau and Dave Filoni had the goods. They were going to be able to continue delivering high-quality content. Then we went to Chapter 10, The Passenger. Now, this one dropped to a 7.8. And uh, this is the one that I think began a soft transition, but not truly all the way. Okay, so this one, the Mandalorian must ferry a passenger with precious cargo on a risky journey. We all remember that this involved the fish lady, right? The fish people and uh, wanting to protect, protect their eggs. And then Grogu, oh, that, that crazy little Grogu, he ate their babies. He ate their eggs for comedic effect. And this really was the first time that we had sort of a uh, childish episode, but it wasn't terrible. It wasn't extreme. And so you can always handle a little bit of, of humor and zaniness. Grogu eating their offspring was weird, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, sometimes you lose a few eggs, right? Sometimes you lose a few. Uh, never mind. Uh, chapter 11, the Harris, uh, 8.7. Again, back to being strong. So you had that one weird childish fish lady episode, but okay. Then we went to episode four, The Siege, another 8.3. Again, uh, more very strong episodes. Gina Carano in there, Carl Weathers in there, looking great, doing good. The series is building. And then we get into just uh, people going nuts. 9.3, this is the point where The Mandalorian had, had really risen to the point that it was almost at an apex. Chapter 13, The Jedi. Uh, this brought in, of course, Ahsoka. Uh, Rosario Dawson playing that one, and uh, this this caused everybody to just think, oh my gosh, uh, th the box has been opened. You know, the, the toy chest is wide open. They can play with any, any character they want now. Anybody can come into this universe. Uh, it was not immature. It brought characters from the cartoons into the universe in a way that was realistic and fun and had gravitas, so everybody was ecstatic. Then we had chapter 14, The Tragedy, 9.1. This is the one where they go and, and Baby Yoda calls out in, into the galaxy trying to find uh, someone who is Force-sensitive, perhaps, a Jedi, perhaps. Directed by Robert Rodriguez, yet did not look like anything that uh, we saw would, later on in the book of Boba Fett as he would take over large duties there. Uh, this one was extremely well-received, and yet again, not at all childish. And then we have episode seven, The Believer, 8.9. It continued to get better and better. Uh, more of uh, Gina Carano in this one, of course, but also introducing uh, some of the Book of Boba Fett precursor stuff that would lead us into that series. And given the fact that this was not at all childish, people thought, well, the Book of Boba Fett is going to be just an insane show. And then we had the big one. Chapter 16, The Rescue, a 9.8. That's nearly impossible to achieve on IMDb. 59,000 ratings on it. 
had they followed in the uh, the way that this this episode went, then right now the Mandalorian and everything involved in it would be it would be at the top of everything in terms of media. It would be the top of everything in terms of cultural impact, viewership, etc. This was where Luke was brought in. And if that had continued, if Grogu had went with Luke, and if this third episode had, or this third season had been sort of the, the anxiety of whether or not Luke would bring back Baby Yoda with a Mandalorian and taking Mandalore need to be rescued by Luke and, and uh, Grogu, would they come to help the Mandalorians take Mandalore and therefore create an alliance between the uh, newly restarted Jedi Order, potentially the Jedi Temple? and the Mandalorians, all of that would have made for a third season that would just have been so huge that you couldn't imagine it. But we're going to see that something completely changed after this. Again, a 9.8. We're going to go into two years, and of course, everybody at this point knows that almost all of the uh, surprise and exhilaration from this episode was annihilated in the Book of Boba Fett, as the Book of Boba Fett took a total shift into being something that was extremely immature and childlike. Now, what we all need to remember is that leading up to this point, only one episode truly had been juvenile. That was the Fish Lady episode. That's the only one that had been silly and, like, really silly. You know, there have been moments of levity, and that's fine, but just one episode of silliness. And here's where things start to go down. Season three, there's a complete and tonal shift. I want everybody to remember, one episode of of silliness, a few episodes of side quests, but mostly a very tight very tight series, well-planned, mature content, not mature in the way of, of graphic violence or uh, egregious uh, uh, depravity or profanity, etc., but mature in the fact that this was a show that was made for grown-ups, and kids could like it too. That was the connecting point was Baby Yoda. That's why he was there, to, to you know give them that entry point into a more grown-up world of Star Wars. Yet, Here's what happens. Chapter 17, The Apostate gets a 7.5 rating. Remember, this was a very poor return to the uh, series, and it caused a lot of people to be, well, concerned. And the storyline should give you some idea of why that concern is there. The Mandalorian begins an important journey. And right from the beginning of this third season, we had some reasons to be concerned. One of those was that we saw in the very beginning of this episode a little kid being brought into the Mandalorian order, and then out of a pool of water that looks like it should be five, six feet deep near the shore, a huge, ginormous whale creature leaps out. Meth whale is there and uh, has to be destroyed by everybody. And that just came across as sophomoric. It was ridiculous. Um, and so that was that was warning sign number one. But things did get better with Chapter 18, The Minds of Mandalore. Um, but... Still not great, an 8.3. Okay, so we're not we're not at the same levels we saw in season two. And then we had chapter 19, The Convert, where we returned to the idea of the sequel trilogy. We had uh, very, um, well, just not good writing at all. This dropped to a 7.0. Then we had chapter 20, The Foundling, which gave us a 7.7. Some people may have even forgotten this one. Uh, to a large degree. Uh, The storyline says Din returns to the hidden Mandalorian uh, convert, so nothing much there. Then we get chapter 21, The Pirate, and remember this is starting to feel a little bit like Side Quest City. Uh, The Pirate, uh, 8.3, but it was uh, quite, uh, quite isolated, I would say, from much of the rest of the story. There wasn't much to this pirate, necessarily. And then we had Season 3, Episode 6. A 6.3, this is where we had the Alice in Wonderland from Disney Channel 90s situation. We had Grogu playing beer pong in space and being knighted for it. Overall, an episode that felt like it was written for 8-year-olds instead. But much of this season felt that way as well. And so there have been at least three now episodes in this season, in Season 3, that were written in a way that felt like they would be a, more appropriate for Disney Junior if you just turn these characters into cheap-looking CGI. Then we had a pop-up on uh, Episode 7. 
Uh, people seemed to like it because they got their hopes up that this was going to be something uh, more exciting. And then we had uh, the episode eight. It's got an 8.6 rating. People seem to be liking it overall. A lot of people were critical in sort of my core audience of how I reviewed this. I gave it an 8 out of 10. But you have to understand that I'm, I'm adjusting now. And you might say, well, what do you mean you're adjusting? And the reason I'm adjusting is because I think, and this is sort of the thesis of this video, that in the first episodes, okay, so in or the first two seasons, there were only really a few side quest episodes and there was really only one juvenile episode. But in season three, what happened is that things were totally changed. If you start looking through these episodes, they're not tightly written. They are heavy on side quests. I, I've joked before that this felt more like Quantum Leap than some sort of, uh, uh, you know, the other, the other seasons felt like a movie, right? A very long movie. And you sat down and you watched the parts play out. Uh, very well written, sort of like strain, uh, uh, Stranger Things. But then this season felt more like we were into some sort of uh, serial sitcom almost. A little action thrown in, but uh, a lot of humor, a lot of silliness, a lot of zaniness, a lot of characters popping in and out. Uh, many of the episodes seemingly not having much connective tissue holding the thing together. And then also, much of it geared far younger, far younger in terms of the characters that we're facing, in terms of the writing style. In fact, the end of chapter 24, when the Mandalorian, and spoiler here, when he's given his little homestead to become uh, the Mandalorian living on a little house on the prairie, uh, he becomes Pa, <laughs> he becomes Din Pa, I guess, Din, Din uh, Pa Ingles. But, uh, you know, when he's given the dialogue between, between himself and the New Republic uh, uh, individual talking about, hey, I'm going to go start doing bounties for the New Republic. That that writing felt very in place for six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. It didn't feel adult or grown-up or mature in any way at all. So why am I giving Chapter 24 an 8 out of 10? Well, Because as a standalone episode, it's fine. It's good. I think it'll entertain kids. And I think that's what has happened here is I think they've made some sort of determination. If you look at the Book of Boba Fett and how it was done with rainbow-colored Vespas, with a bounty hunter who can't be tough at all, when you look at the way that uh, he supposedly rules with uh, uh, an iron fist, it's more like uh, a bubble-wrapped fist. And then we see this same tonal shift existing here. I don't know who's made this call to make the tonal shift. I don't know who's decided that we're going to aim now for kids instead of grown-ups. But it feels like a tremendous bait-and-switch to me. The Star Wars Filoni Favreau universe was aimed at legacy fans, and it was insanely popular because of it. Now it feels like it's something that's being dumbed down, corporatized by Disney, sterilized. Perhaps this is coming from Kathleen Kennedy. Perhaps this is coming from others. I've reached out to sources to see if I can find out what's going on, but I don't know yet. But definitely there's a tonal shift, and I hope that I've demonstrated that to you objectively now. Again, first two seasons, one juvenile episode, a few crazy side quests. And by the way, those were rated the lowest. Season three, the majority of season three, side quests and juvenile episodes. And it's no wonder that many of the fans have checked out. But in terms of what they're up to and why they're doing this, there may be a marketing reason. Perhaps they've looked at the marketing, perhaps they've looked at the merchandising of Baby Yoda, and they have decided, rightly or wrongly, that this is a show that should be aimed for kiddos and maybe that also tells us why they brought Baby Yoda back uh, to the Mandalorian away from Luke so quickly. One, I think that's just so dumb. Because if you had left him with Luke, you would have sold toys like crazy with Baby Padawan, uh, Grogu, and Luke uh, packaged together. It would have been it would have been nuts. But they didn't want to do that. Somebody said no. And when those when uh, Baby Yoda was brought back with Mandalorian, something to me says that. On the merchandising side, they've decided that they need to make these shows now be aimed for kids, not for the older demographic. So it's an inversion of the strategy. Previously, first two seasons, when it was bonkers popular, aim at the adults, grabbing the kids with Baby Yoda. Now we've gone the opposite direction. And so we'll see how that plays out.
A lot of you are not big fans of this third season. I personally think it's a 4 out of 10, but I think the finale is an, uh, fin the finale is an 8 out of 10. I only think that because I'm holding it in isolation. But in terms of the direction of the series, I think they're aiming for somebody different now. And to me, that's a disservice to all of you who enjoyed this show up until this latest season. And I'm not sure long term that this is going to work out at all. It feels to me like all of Star Wars is being damaged by uh, this, this refocusing on just, well, very young content. But that's what I think of it for now. Maybe Star Wars is now for little kids only. We'll find out as we go forward. I have a feeling the Acolyte is not going to be for little kids, but that may not be for anybody else either. Folks, if you like content like this, consider clicking the like button, share, subscribe, and you can stick it to the algorithms when you click it. We're talking about that notification bell. The Pro Show is 5 to 7, Thursdays. That's in the evening, not in the morning. We don't wake up that early. We covet your comments, so drop one down below. And if you'd like to consider becoming a member, it's the price of a soda. Dip your toes on in and see all the exclusive content that we have for you. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun.